It's a sultry July weekend in Laurel, Maryland. On this day, 300 people from all over the world have come to remember old crusades and to introduce the next generation. Anybody want a special blessing from the Lord? Just got to help with the dishes. Just over here, help me. It's an unlikely gathering. There are those who still fervently believe in the sect. And there are the ex-members who have been hurt by the group and who have come back for healing. We do thank you, Lord, for this time, and we pray that you continue to unite us, continue to wash away hurt, wash away pain. They call themselves away, the family. Uh, all that, Lord Jesus, they used to be known Ashley. as the children of God before the trouble started. There's one family member who isn't here, the group's founder, David Berg. Berg's teachings, especially those about sex, once inspired the family, and then later almost destroyed it. Until his death in 1994, Berg was seen as a prophet by tens of thousands. He was also seen as a fugitive by Interpol and as a seducer of young women by just about everybody. He saw himself as touched by the hand of God. The man who will found the children of God, David Brandt Berg, is born in 1919 into a family of preachers going back two centuries. His early years are spent on the gospel trail, accompanying his Bible-thumping parents on their holy crusades. His mother, Virginia, is one of the stars of the Southern Circuit. Her signature sermon recounts a miracle that once brought her back from the dead. To young David, his mother is a living saint. The church is also the setting for early revelations in the boy's life, ones that Berg will later write about when he has become a prophet. I will never forget that I was taught how to masturbate by an older boy who whispered it in my ear during one of my father's Sunday morning sermons. Later, David's mother catches him masturbating. She forces him to complete the deed in front of his father. This is the beginning of what will be the central conflict in Berg's life, his love of sex and the church's teaching that sex for its own sake is a sin. Over the next two decades, David Berg marries, has a family, and tries to emulate his mother as a knock -em dead preacher. But the established churches have no room for David Berg. In desperation, he even builds his own church. But after three years, he's kicked out. Something about sexual impropriety, which is never proven. At home, things aren't going any better. For many years, David always said that a man could have two wives. That it was according to the Bible that it wasn't wrong to have two wives. But I, in my mind, I said, well, I hope it never happens to me. But I knew when he was traveling around, you know, that he wasn't totally uh, faithful to one wife, you know. By the time he's 50, Berg has come to hate the established churches and has abandoned his dream of becoming a preacher. Not knowing what else to do, he organizes his four kids into a gospel singing group and heads to California.
It's 1968, the summer of love. Revolution is in the air. Berg's kids, now called Teens for Christ, evangelize on the beaches during the day. At night, they pack them in at the local Christian hangar. Once again, David Berg is relegated to the shadows. Then one night, Berg's mother, the preacher known as the little woman with the big message, dies. Berg later describes his mother's death as the moment when his bitterness was transformed into a voice for revolution. You are the revolution of God. You are the kingdom of God. I can still remember David Berg walking into that light club and he's got on some kind of a uh, kimono <laughs> from the East, <laughs> but that was his version of a hippie, madras, you know, uh, psychedelic shirt. And he'd come in there kind of trying to blend in, and it, people would look at him and go, wow, <laughs> what, who are you, man? <laughs> Here was his congregation. These were the people that all those sermons had been priming him for. <laughs> This was the crowd. This was the crowd for this message, and they just ate it up, and they just exploded with it. It was just so wonderful. Berg's youngest daughter, Faithy, and the new recruits are soon in the streets evangelizing to the hippies. So likewise, whosoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. What's that mean? You got to give it all up. I gotta give it all up? Yeah, all that stuff, man. Oh, that's kinda rough, man. <laughs> that's my lifestyle. But man, it's not giving you peace. Come on. You're walking down that road, man, you're smoking the dope, right? Yeah. But you're not happy, you ain't got the peace, you ain't playing the music you really want to play. Yeah. God's gotta give it to you. Berg's message is tailor-made for the counterculture. Forsake all for Jesus, and to hell with the system. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Come into my life. Change my life. Change my life. Help me to have that born-again experience. What is that? Help me to have a born-again experience. Help me to have a born-again experience. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. How's that? How's that for first time, huh? I fell in love with the hippies. I mean, we had preached to so many church kids, get out and do something to help people, you know taking them out on the streets, and it was just like we could not activate those people. And here, one press of the button, and she, there was a disciple right there in front of you, just ready to follow me home. I'd never experienced anything like that before. It was like you walked into a big bubble of love, and everybody's faces were so bright and shining, and it was an experience that I'd never had, and I wanted to, I just wanted to stay and see what this was all about. So now that I came to the Lord, I don't have any more doubts, and I love the Lord, and I want everybody to know it. Amen. And I want everybody to be saved. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. The churches, he felt, weren't doing the job that Christians are called by Jesus to do, and that's the great commission he gave us all was go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So it's like he had the vision to train us to be the missionaries. I think the unique thing about the children of God that uh, really touched the kids was that you could serve God now. You didn't have to go to four years of Bible school or the conventional route, but that you could actually today forsake all you have and go and serve the Lord. Within a few months, the failed preacher has 90 devoted disciples. If only his mother could see him now. We picketed churches, jail and schools. We had sit-ins, march-ins, protests, and everything kids loved. Everything that was radical. I was masterminding the whole thing behind the scenes with Jesus. Unfortunately for Berg, 
The forces of law and order don't share his religious views, no matter who's pulling the strings. It isn't long before Berg and his disciples feel the heat and hit the road. Their destination is the promised land. Although just where that is, nobody, not even Berg, is all that sure. Well, you get out and you have uh, 50 people using the bathroom or, you know, gassing up 29 vehicles with a credit card from some brother's father. Uh, it's a stir wherever you go. In 1969, Stephen Ferguson is an acid head going nowhere. Then, Berg and his entourage, who now call themselves the Children of God, come to town. They thought the gypsies had landed, but this was different than the gypsies because these were a lot of, lo of long-haired teenagers singing, praising the Lord, talking about Jesus, no cigarettes, no drugs, no alcohol no sex outside of marriage or any of that stuff. It was very puritanical in its origins. As the Berg Road Show moves east, the kids often stop to proselytize. At each town, disciples are recruited. Then the caravan moves on. Berg soon whips the new recruits into disciplined missionaries. The kids wear sackcloth and smear their foreheads with ashes as a sign America is about to be destroyed. Warning, they cry, the end time is coming. In the end time, the forces of good will battle it out with the Antichrist. When the dust settles, Berg assures them, Jesus and the children of God will rule the world. While waiting for the end time to arrive, the children of God have a practical problem, where to live. It was exciting for the first months on the road, but it, it got to be quite wearing. For one thing, we only had hallelujah showers at Bear Creek Park, and I mean, you'd hear those people in there shouting hallelujahs if their life depended on it. That's where they got the name Hallelujah Showers because <laughs> the water was so cold, you just <laughs> My father, he would go around at night and uh, lay hands on the sick and pray for them. I, I remember one day he really prayed that the Lord would give us a home so that we could get all these people up off the ground and into warm quarters for the winter. Just when it seems they're truly lost, the Lord delivers. This time it's 400 acres of Badlands called the Texas Soul Clinic. We're making rockets, guns, search buildings and a new chamber of commerce. Last week we went to school for the but the teacher said that Billy was having some problems and she was out smoking marijuana today. Drugs are just one of the kids' problems. Many come from troubled families. Others are just plain lost. But within months, because of Berg's teachings drawn from the Bible, all that changes. They say that killing people is the only way, but I'm sure that if Many now refer to Berg as Moses David for having led them out of the wilderness. Others call him simply Dad. How many guys here used to be on drugs? Yeah. 
1970, Hap Wotilla is a revolutionary for Jesus. He's been with Berg since the beginning and is one of his most loyal followers. Our minds were on the kingdom of God and preaching the gospel and the revolution for Jesus. This is the time of the end. Jesus is coming soon. The Antichrist is about to appear, the tribulation. We don't have time for this, this stuff of the flesh and those, these pleasures of life. Uh, we need to stay focused on the revolution for Jesus. With the Lord in their hearts and Berg's warnings on their minds, the children of God stock up on provisions and wait for the end time to come. The end time, however, doesn't arrive on schedule. The prophet sets new dates. These two are broken. But Berg's lessons more than make up for a couple of missed cataclysms. Sam Halbert, an ex-con, saw his life turned around by Berg. All these buildings that you see uh, were full of uh, revolutionaries for Jesus. It was like a completely different lifestyle than anything I'd ever experienced. I mean, I'm one day I'm sitting in my apartment, uh, talking to my friends, going to work, taking drugs, listening to rock music. The next day, I'm memorizing five, ten scriptures a day, uh, playing songs, uh, praising God, uh, praying. I mean, it was an incredible change, like from dark to daylight. Sort of like a missionary boot camp. Until this point, David Berg is the charismatic leader of a group of fundamentalist Christians. Then something extraordinary happens that changes everything. One day, I was teaching a class, and so I said, turn over Ezekiel 34, and it came down to verse 23 where it says, and I will set up one shepherd over them, even my servant David, and he shall feed them and be their shepherd. When, when I read that, everybody just kind of burst into tongues and praising God, and some people got down on their knees. It was just one of those electric, heavy things. This letter comes out from Dad and says, one of us had written to him recently suggesting that maybe he was the David of Ezekiel 34, and he said that as he was musing over that, that the Lord spoke to him and said, why do you deny your name, David? And according to him, he was shocked and said, what do you mean, Lord? And that then he began getting the revelation that he was the David of Ezekiel 34. According to some scholars, the David of Ezekiel is the harbinger of the fiery end of the world. David Berg now proclaims that he is, in fact, this biblical prophet. How does he know? God told him so. He was more than head and shoulders above all the rest of us. He was Moses up on the mountain, and we were the children. And we so appreciated him and the revolution that he gave to us and so appreciated what it was accomplishing and the lives that were being touched and that uh, our loyalty was him, to him was like unquestioned. I was lying between two naked women in our camper when I first received the gift of tongues. The one I was making love to would suddenly turn into one of these beautiful goddesses and I would immediately explode in an orgasm of tremendous spiritual power while at the same time prophesying violently in some foreign tongue. Imbued with the spirit of the Lord, Berg emerges noisily from his camper. He is wrapped in chains. So he stands in front of everybody, stops, <clears throat> comes to a stop, and uh, he goes, looks at everybody very seriously, he goes, this is what the system marriage will do to you. And then he said something like, but Jesus is going to set us free, and he throws the chains off. So everybody goes, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. Newly liberated, Berg receives another revelation. 
out with the old, in with the new. He drops his ever faithful wife, Jane, and takes up with his 19-year-old secretary, Maria. I noticed they had a lot of affinity toward each other. I told my son, I think dad has a second wife, you know. I thought maybe he would say, yes, I, I better help you out, mother. I'll, I'll take care of it, you know. He, he, he was a good son. And he said, well, that's up to him if that's his choice. Don't you, don't say anything against it. So I accepted it. At this particular time, Mo had not only taken on this new wife, but he also had um, uh, accumulated a number of other wives <laughs> that he called wives. In letters to his disciples, Berg's burgeoning pride is amply illustrated. His Mo letters become the guiding light for the children of God. Berg portrays himself as Moses David, king of the jungle, and he creates a doctrine that is uniquely his, the law of love. When I went to visit him in this apartment in Dallas, uh, he, was, he and Maria were in one bed, and uh, one of his wives um, was in another bed, and he said, why don't you go over and love whatever her name was. So I'm there making love to this one girl uh, who was one of Mo's wives, and he's in the bed making love to Maria. Berg's new insights about sex, his law of love, come directly, he says, from the Lord. To the pure, all things are pure, as long as they are done in love. He will use this rationale to do just about anything he desires. Why didn't I, at that time, stand up and say, wait a minute, Dad, this is off the wall. This is crazy. How can you say this? This is false doctrines. And you know why I didn't? It was simple, because I had an interest in believing that. In my heart, I was dedicated to the Lord. But also in my heart, I wished that we could all share. Is your daughter in the children of God? Yes. Do you consider she's held against her will? Uh, yes. Uh, when I talked to her all by myself, she said that she would go home with me. As soon as we were confronted by uh, the elders from the children of God, they, um, she started to scream that she could not leave, that she would die if she left the gate. and. Uh, and I believe, actually, that she was very terrified. Your father has indicated that you were being kept against your will. That's not true, because the only thing, when I met the children of God, they showed me in the Bible a few scriptures, and I believed it, and I knew that's what I wanted to do, and, and I'm here because I want to be here, and I want to stay, and I want to continue. Under considerable pressure from parents, Berg flees to England with Maria. He leaves the children of God behind to face the music. A concert is arranged in Texas to convince skeptical parents there's nothing to be afraid of. The parents don't buy it. The parents' next tactic is to pressure the Texas Soul Clinic into evicting the children of God. Frightened phone calls are made to the prophet in England. Far from being dismayed, Berg tells them it's God's will. They will colonize the world for Jesus. The children of God disperse en masse throughout Europe and South America, where they continue spreading the word for Jesus. Berg's daughter, Faithy, ends up evangelizing in Libya while explaining the love of Jesus to a devout Muslim, she somehow ends up in bed with the man. Of course, I had never, ever had sex with anybody that um, I wasn't married to. And I had never had sex <clears throat> with anybody that was um, what I would consider a heathen. <laughs> Guilt-ridden, Faithy immediately calls her father, who has already been in touch with the Almighty. 
my father said, why, it's exactly the same day we got this prophecy. We called the flirty fish. And he said, why, it's amazing. He said, this is exactly what God was revealing to us, that there, there would be instances in which we would have to portray God's love in a physical way and that there was nothing wrong with it. Berg's vision seems divinely inspired. What else but sex could save souls and feel so good all at the same time? Flirty fishing is the name Berg gives this new path to salvation. Later, Berg will call this missionary work simply FFing. My pretty little fishes, would you do anything for Jesus to help your fishermen catch souls, even suffer the crucifixion of the hook or the danger of the trap? Think it over. How far would you go? All the way? One night, in the night Dad had a revelation, he saw across the, in front of his eyes, these red letters that said Tenerife. He went and he got him, you know, an atlas and he looked it up and it was in the Canary Islands and he knew then the Lord wanted him to go there. And while they were at the hotel, they, there was a lot of the different waiters and different people there that they started getting close to and, and Dad felt led to, he wanted to witness to them and, and they had been FFing in, in England so they started FFing some of these guys. In time, they needed some help so they started bringing other, a couple other girls to help out. Eventually, I think there was about 20 or 25 girls there and they would go out with dad every night. They were there, uh, I guess, about a year, and it started to become pretty big news. This, this particular club started to have a lot of people come to it. People were heard about it in Scandinavia and Germany, and people were flying there to, f to see about these girls who made love to men and told them about Jesus. Anxious to spread the good news of FFing, Berg begins publishing his Mo letters. These instruct his disciples on everything from his obsession with cleanliness to how to make love to a fish. They also chart an unambiguous trail into the inner workings of the prophet's mind. I think he believed whatever he felt, whatever he thought, whatever his inclination was, that that was God. Even if he was drunk at the time, that that was the Lord. Well, I did it, so it must be the Lord. I don't think he left the door open to the fact that the devil could be speaking to him and leading him into any of these areas at all. Much of the deeper revelations that I have received from the Lord were so in the spirit that I was not even conscious of what was happening and afterwards I had to be told what had been said. All I know is this is the way God speaks to me and has from the beginning. And I am only a messenger boy who delivers his telegrams. And I'm not responsible for what has been said or revealed. You'll have to blame God for that, or thank him. Dad started, started to teach us about the law of love and how far, what that meant. Like, where do you stop when you're talking about love? There's no boundary, there's no limit. You go all the way with love. Uh, that might be sort of a mind blower for most mainstream people, but at the time it, 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 was, it was not difficult because you really felt like that was what they needed and that was really the Lord's love for them. And you didn't feel like there was anything wrong with it. You felt like that was like the ultimate in showing them how much God loved them. When all the FFing started, I thought, well, maybe I'm just being closed-minded. Maybe I've taken on a religious point of view. I try to see it from the point of view that, well, maybe they're, if this is God's prophet and he's got this big word from God, maybe he knows a little more. He's been, you know, this man has studied the word for years. He's, his mother was an evangelist. He must know more than I do. Woody and the rest of the sect use the world's streets as their church. They are now calling themselves the family of love. During the day, they witness to lost souls. Hundreds sign on. During the night, the women flirty fish. If it's a good time for the children of God, it's anything but for their parents, who begin to organize the world's first anti-cult movement. Uh, the deceit that is in this group is unbelievable. 
and uh, what it is doing to our youth is just unreal. Now, I think any person who preaches the Word of God would not teach and preach something like this with such dirty language. In Tenerife, word reaches the prophet that the cops are on his trail. In the middle of the night, one night, the Lord woke Dad up and said, you've got to leave today. Get out of the country today. So he did. He got up. I mean, when the Lord told Dad to do something, he did it. So they got up, they packed their stuff, and they got on the train, and they found out, just after they crossed the border into France, they took the train, they found out that the borders, that the order had gone out to close the borders to Dad, to arrest him. And they were trying to charge him with, uh, I don't know, debauchery or some crazy thing. You know, just some sort of trumped up chart. While in hiding, Berg experiments with another method of communication, the video camera. And if you shine forth with enough love, others will reflect it. Love wasn't put in your heart to stay. Love isn't love until you give it away. Deep within, then he's on his way. His inspirational videos often accompany the illustrated Mo letters. These seductive packages are sent weekly to over 700 colonies in 70 countries. If you use that technique and you actually led somebody to the Lord who was despairing of life, who was a mess that was on drugs or something, and through flirty fishing them, they not only accepted the Lord, but were no longer suicidal, were, gave up their drugs, and started reading the Bible and trying to serve Jesus, you'd, be, you'd say, this must be of God. Certainly the numbers seem to indicate Berg is onto something. Membership in the children of God is growing rapidly, and flirty fishing, not unexpectedly, is proving to be a recruitment boom. By 1982, close to half a million souls have been FF'd. One in eight accepts the Lord. My sexy little fishes are doing the job. They tease them, flirt with them, then screw them until they drop. That's the way to bring them to the Lord. Forget all that old-fashioned gospel preaching. We're six times more effective than Billy Graham. Praise the Lord. He would teach the women to be extra loving with their husbands to help compensate for the sacrifices they were making. Or he would teach them that to try to provide somebody for them to be with, to have that companionship while they're gone. Uh, he told about his, you know, how difficult it was, the jealousy, that he had a letter called The Man Who Played God. And he likened it to how God, when he sent Jesus to the, to the world, he missed him. And when he saw his own son being nailed to the cross, that it was painful for him. He said, that's how we men feel about our women who are being nailed, basically. I remember nights when my wife was out FFing and, and uh, out with other brothers, or not actually other brothers in the home. She was mainly out FFing in town in Manila. I remember this one night when she was, she was sharing with someone else. One of the other shepherds came along and said, would you like to share with me? And I couldn't. All I did was I sat there and I, I just shared my heart with her. I spoke to her, I talked with her the entire evening while, she, while my wife was away. The children of God started their war with the Antichrist in the Texas desert. Ten years later, they're pursuing the war in nightclubs and bars, from Athens to Rangoon, anywhere needy fish swim. Um, there's Faithy there in the foreground with this sweet gentleman, the ambassador of France. She was able to really witness to him, and he really fell in love that night. We have sweet babe David dancing with one of his little sheep to the song, Some Enchanted Evening. Here you see Faithy as she witnesses to the vice president of the company from Sweden. And he's asking her, at this time, do you think I'll go to heaven? Very, very sweet man who really enjoyed their contact that night. There was always a risk of getting sidetracked or getting off the main line of things, losing your priorities. 
And this happened to a number of people. It happened to me sometimes, and it happens to people that I know, where you get your eyes off the Lord and what the real goal is, and onto the fun and the games of it all, because it was quite an enjoyable ministry at times. By 1984, Berg is once again disguised and on the run. Interpol, not impressed with Flirty Fishing's phenomenal success, has issued a warrant for his arrest on charges of running a prostitution ring. He was so security conscious. He always sat with his back to the wall and says, I don't want my back to the wall when I'm talking to my troops. I don't want them to get me in the back like they did Anastasia. And he, he just seemed so obsessed with this thing of almost paranoid. Berg is soon so fearful that he permits no undoctored photographs of himself. There are people all over the world who would love to get their hands on the elusive Berg. Dad had found out early on that somebody had taken a contract on him, out on his life. Uh, there were people who had said they would definitely do him some physical damage. I know of somebody who said they'd blow his head off with a shotgun if he could, if he, if he saw him, that he would. So he had real reason to stay behind the scenes. It turned out in Hong Kong that what well, I can speak of from my own personal experience, that uh, the family had a, a friend in an escort agency who made it possible for the family girls to meet people at hotels on an invitation basis. There was a situation with my wife where she accompanied business people for a whole weekend for several thousand dollars. I went to uh, one of my overseers and I just, I just poured out my heart and said, I feel, I feel like a whore. He said, oh, that's part of being crucified for Christ. That's part of the burden you bear. It's hard to understand why I could be set so dumb, <laughs> but I wanted so badly to believe that this was God's will because it had some flash of being exceptional. But somewhere in the middle of it, your heart just goes, this can't be right. There's something wrong, but you've got yourself locked into a concept of, but he can't be wrong. Is that stupid or what? Hundreds of thousands of people were, were met the Lord that way. And, and I'm pretty convinced that when we get to heaven and those people are in heaven, we're not gonna be hanging our head in shame that we FF those people into heaven, I think those people are going to come and kneel down and say, thank you for doing that. Thank you for, for that sacrifice. Berg is finding fewer and fewer places to hide. He is drinking heavily, and his Mo letters, written at a furious pace, are becoming increasingly bizarre and revealing. Your goddamn churches and all that theoretical. That was a 17th century French soldier raping the Queen of England. It wasn't as if goddamn the Jews, those antichrist Christ. He sees conspiracies everywhere, especially amongst the Jews and the blacks. That's genius level. He counsels mothers to masturbate their young sons to sleep. He constantly berates the churches for being bastions of hypocrisy. He chronicles his many sexual adventures in lurid detail, including being seduced by ancient spirit goddesses, who look surprisingly contemporary. I say, what's wrong with the French Cabernet Sauvignon? One of Berg's few regrets, he says, is that he never slept with his mother. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over the enemy. The moment someone actually did take issue with almost anything, they were taken aside and talked to, and if they held on to that position, it was contrary to what Mo had said or the way the group was going, they began to be not just talked to but dealt with. This was considered a problem, like they were listening to the devil or something. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank
healing. There was very little room for a person to hold an opinion different from Mo, different from leadership, and still be able to function in the family. You either got with the program or you left. Pap Wotilla is one of the first to be excommunicated for questioning Berg's program. Soon other outspoken disciples are also forced to leave. As Berg tightens his grip on the children of God, he no longer looks for earthly advice. As a bona fide prophet, David Berg gets all his counsel directly from above. Dad personally was a sexy guy, and he would, you know, he would hug the girls and kiss them, and they, he would have sex with them. It, it, it wasn't just sex for sex; it was love. What he did, he did in love, and the girls wanted to be with him. And Dad said, "Well, look, why don't you try to do some erotic sort of dances? Well, let's try that out and see what it's like." And, and so they did some, and it was sweet. I mean, they did them for Dad, and like he sort of gave, coached them how to do it. He said, "Well." have the sarong on you and then towards the end you can let it down and raise your hands up and praise to God and he wrote some letters like glorify God in the dance. He was very very explicit he wanted three songs one slow get faster then fade out he didn't want you to be totally naked he wanted you to have you know use some he was more into the Grecian thing that make it beautiful but he are he made it very instructions from A to Z how to do it. For Dad, it was very sweet because Dad didn't see the family. Dad didn't go visit homes and didn't have a lot of visitors to the home. So this was a way for him to see family members. But he was very appreciative. I admire the girls for doing that. It's, you know, when you look around, you've got video lights and video camera, and you've got to get up there and, and dance like that. Uh, it takes a bit of humility, I'd say. John came to me and she said, well, Dad suggested that I make love to him in the latest comment tape. Uh, do you think I should masturbate? And said, I said, of course, that sounds beautiful. And on the first take, I was masturbating to you. And um, when I came, I broke out in strong tongues. I couldn't control it. And uh, the last few words were, Father, I love you. Why did he need it so bad? Like I said, I think he had a lot of unreconciled sexual issues himself, and you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. I think he just couldn't get enough of it, you know? We didn't look at it as any kind of sexual thing. Not with the little kids, for sure. Dad certainly didn't. And it was like dress up. You know, they saw their moms putting on beads and putting on a sarong and putting their hair up, and they wanted to do the same thing, and they did. Meanie, who was dad's granddaughter, came to live with us when she was about 12. And I remember very clearly dad talking to us about her coming. And he said, Look, this is my granddaughter. And I haven't seen her since she was, I don't know, one or two years old. And I want to take care of her. Meanie lives with Berg for four years, during which time she suffers several mental breakdowns. Not knowing how to handle her, the family tries non-traditional means. We believe in exorcism. We believe in laying hands and praying for people. And we did that for her sometimes. And, and there were times when we did pray for her that she had you know, for a few months was doing fine, but then she would relapse into it. Later, Mini will accuse her grandfather of sexual abuse. Yes, we will gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with you saints at the river that flows by the throne. 
beautiful river that flows right out of the throne of God in the heavenly city, right through the center of the city, like a park, with a park on both sides with trees and grass. By 1992, David Berg is suffering from shingles and impotence. His mind turns once again to the end time, this time his own. The prophet's vision of heaven is a pyramid 1,500 miles on each side. There will be singing water, dancing colors. People will be able to walk through walls and fly. Aren't you glad you're going to be there? There's going to be music in heaven. Oh, all kinds of music, orchestras, choruses, dancing, choirs of angels and us. All the wonderful, beautiful things you enjoyed right here on Earth, including beautiful people, beautiful men and women, beautiful youth, even beautiful sex and love. Think of that. On the night of May 15, 1992, police tactical squads are on the move in Melbourne and Sydney. At dawn, the raids begin. It was the biggest police operation of its kind ever in this country. Synchronized raids in two states against a religious sect known as the Children of God. By the raid's end, 144 children had been taken from six homes. As allegations of child abuse mount, several family homes are also raided in Europe and South America. Dozens of family members are thrown in jail. Hundreds of children are taken into custody and given gynecological examinations. Five days for Jesus! I haven't seen my wife, I couldn't contact my parents. They don't even know where I am. Berg's whereabouts remain unknown. Once again, he leaves his disciples to fend for themselves. There is religious persecution in Argentina. Tell the whole world. Sometime in 1994, while the family's legal case is still before the courts, David Burke, also known as Moses David, Mo, and Dad, dies. judge is under attack tonight after giving permission for a three-year-old boy to be brought up by his mother in a notorious religious sect with a history of child abuse. Lord Justice Ward accepted assurances from the mother and the leaders of the family cult that they had turned their back on the teachings of their late founder. The judge branded him a sex-obsessed child molester and pornographer. In a damning 135,000-word report, Lord Justice Ward said in the past, children had been harmed by the sex's law of love, which he described as a pernicious doctrine, robbing children of their innocence. Despite clear evidence of past transgressions, courts throughout the world rule that sexual acts involving children are no longer being practiced. The family is acquitted of all charges. Today, there's a new ark sailing the uncharted waters of religious fundamentalism. The family now includes the children of the original founder. And um, this is what we do in D.C., everything from distributing food and clothing mm -hmm. to performing at white, the White House or dip for different benefits. This is some pictures of our food and clothing distribution. And all of us are actually children of missionaries. We've grown up in different countries. For example, I was in Argentina. 
This is performing at the White House for Christmas. Oh, no. This is at uh, different radio stations. Radio Some things program. haven't changed. This is a Family members still witness, program. and they still ask others to provide their needs. So um, we came here today, and a few of the farmers were able to donate some produce for us. <laughs> now with the White House on their CV, the family is moving more mainstream. Today, flirty fishing is no longer used to woo converts. Though free love is still practiced among family members, their witnessing has moved back to the streets and boardwalks. There are 9,000 family members left. There used to be 38,000 full-time adherents and hundreds of thousands more who were in some way touched by the family. But with two-thirds of the members under 21, the family is growing again. In Jesus' name, amen. Here you go. They still believe the end time is just around the corner. And despite his checkered past, David Berg is still what holds them together. Prophecy is a real thing. The spirit world is a real thing. If he could get prophecy when he's here, he can give it to us now, too. And he's, he gives prophecies and he speaks to us, just like when he was here, just he's a little more. He's all healthy and I'm sure he's much happier. He speaks to us from the spirit. Until David Berg's death, only a handful of his disciples had ever seen him. Now, selected pictures of the prophet are displayed on the wall next to that of Jesus. Berg's more revolutionary writings, especially those about sex, have been heavily sanitized or removed from circulation. Father David is a departed saint guiding or helping to guide the family from beyond, for sure. The same as Jesus guides us from beyond. He does give counsel. Since Berg's death, Peter Amsterdam chats daily with the beloved prophet. One of Berg's first directives was for Peter to become King Peter. Another was for him to marry Berg's still powerful widow, Maria. And he spoke to me, he said, he said, son, when I'm gone, you have to help her carry the crown. You have to help Maria carry the crown. You have to be with her and take care of her. Uh, he said, you're a real king, and you'll be King Peter, and she'll be Queen Maria. You know, and it was this, sort of this whole prophecy, sort of. Hallelujah, hallelujah, with a new king to lead them and a queen that they revere, the family rejoices in its remarkable comeback. The sect is now open enough to admit some of its past errors, but the healing process is just beginning. I do know young people who were introduced to sex at a very young age, at very young age, by adults. And I realize that maybe that only happened in the family for a few years. But to say that it didn't happen, when they hear the family say these things, how does it make them feel? What does that do to them? They're sitting there going, I know that happened. It's given them all kinds of turmoil and problems. I am convinced after memorizing 5,000 verses word for word from the Bible, and after reading it, studying it constantly for all those seven years, that you can justify almost anything if you know enough scripture verses.
All you have to do is open the door and let him in. All you have to do is pray with me and say, Jesus, please come into my heart. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died for me. Please forgive me of my sins and come into my heart, Lord Jesus.